3 John, the epistle of John. There's only one chapter there, and I only want to read a couple of verses. And I want to talk to you about the man that you've never heard of before, right? How many of you have ever heard of a man by the name of Diotrephus? Maybe some of you have, but uh, I didn't realize what this guy's name was. And even after the Lord told me about him here a few weeks ago, I had to spend quite a bit of time meditating on that word before I got it, his name before I started getting it right. Diotrephus was a troublemaker. And he caused a lot of problems for one of John's churches. We don't know who the church is. We don't know where the church was. We don't know if this guy was a leader. We don't know what he was. But one thing he was, was a troublemaker. <clears throat> and so, let's get into 3 John chapter 1, verse 8. And one of the issues that they were having in this church is that there were some of the brethren that weren't being received, and also the apostolic leaders, which would have included the Apostle John, and uh, those who worked with him in the work of the apostolic were not being received because of this man, Diotrephus. And you'll notice that here in uh, uh, verse 8, where I'll begin reading. We therefore ought to receive such, that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Verse 9, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephus, who loved to have preeminence among them, receives us not. Wherefore, this is the disciple of love, wherefore, when I come, I remember this fellow. I remember his deeds, which he does prating against us with malicious words. Not content therewith, neither does he, he himself receive the brethren, and he forbids them that would receive them. And he casts the people that would receive them out of the church. In verse 11 he says, Beloved, follow not that which is evil. In other words, this man's deeds are evil. Don't follow that. Don't let that uh, influence your actions. Follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God. He that doeth evil hath not seen God. And so, I want to get into this a little bit because it's going to be the thrust of, of a message that I felt like the Lord gave me prophetically. Uh, at, if we allow this spirit in our midst... Uh, and, and I don't know if allowing it in our midst, but if we allow it to have preeminence in our midst, it will hinder revival. I want you to get that. It hinders revival. And so there's, there's five things here that stand out about this diatrephus. Number one, he loved preeminence. He wanted to be in charge. He wanted to have say. He wanted to be the one people looked to. He wanted to be the influencer. Number two is he came against the apostolic. The apostle Paul uh, or John here says that he he prating against us with malicious words. He was constantly undermining the godly leadership that God had put in place so that he could have preeminence. This was this diatrephus. The other thing we see about him is is he used uh, words, prating words, malicious language to slander and to lie about the real people that God wanted to be in charge of uh, the church and the fellowship here. Good. The other thing we see about him is he would not receive the brethren. There were brethren outside these circles, apparently outside this church, that would have had an opportunity to really impart to the church, but he wouldn't receive them, and he would also forbid others from receiving them. The spirit of Diotrephus. Now, it doesn't say if he was a leader or if he was laity, but he was apparently a man of influence, and he used his influence to get his ends accomplished to achieve his purposes. I want you to note that. 
to get his way, to get his ends accomplished, to get done what he wanted done. I want you to see that. Diatrephus, and this is the thrust of my message here today, was a controller. He was controlling. He was a control freak. He had a controlling spirit. That's some modern terminology thrown into there. Ultimately, it comes down to the fact that in his desire for preeminence, he would undermine God's true leaders. He would undermine God's true doctrine. He would undermine God's true vision and God's true purpose for the church so that he could get his ends accomplished. Now, just recently, the Lord gave me a word of the Lord on revival. He said, for the Holy Spirit, for revival to come, the Holy Spirit has to be given control. Has to be given control of a church, has to be given control of a home, has to be given control of a community. You want to see revival in a church? That church has to allow the Spirit of God to take control. Now, when the Spirit of God is in control, there's godly leaders still in place. It may even appear to the carnal eye like the godly leaders are in charge of things. But the difference between a diatrephimus and Apostle John or Gaius, the other guy that the apostle who was, who was a, a beloved friend who walked in truth, a friend of uh, the Apostle John's, the difference between a diatrephimus and an Apostle John is an Apostle John's motive, his desire, his focus. Everything that he did had to do with getting the church focused on where Jesus and the Holy Spirit wanted him to take. Everything diatrephus wanted out of the church was to get his ends accomplished. A controlling spirit. Godly leaders must guard against a diatrephus, against a controller coming in and trying to take over and trying to get their vision to the people, to get their doctrine into the people, to get their purpose into the people. To, to, they have, godly leaders have to stand up and resist the spirit of diatrephus trying to take preeminence in a church. Years ago, I had an old preacher tell me soon after I was ordained, he said, if you don't run your church, somebody else will. I found it to be that way. When the man of God backs off, backs down, says, well, I don't want to be too controlling. Somebody else will step up and take over, and a lot of times it'll be a diatrephus. We had, uh, years ago, wasn't that many years ago, it was just before this recent outpouring, several years ago, had somebody in our church, and through a series of circumstances, they're no longer there, and I didn't want to see that because of the circumstances that took them out. And, uh, but what happened was, after they were gone, revival broke out. And one of the things I had a question to the Lord on was, man, you know, if this revival would have came earlier, we could have helped this person. And uh, the word of the Lord came to me, and it went something like this. Do you know, it, it came in the form of a question. Do you know how hard it is to change a controller? And the second thing is, second question the Lord asked me is, do you think you would be experiencing the revival that you are now if this controller were still in your midst? This person was not a church leader. But the attention always had to be on this person. Regardless of what was going on. 
that there were altar services. And I want to say this carefully because some of you aren't coming up here when you need to be. But if there was an altar service, this person was always the first one up in there demanding prayer. Behind that was a demand for preeminence. And it, it was a controlling spirit. This person, every word of knowledge that was given in the church was for this person. They couldn't think that it might possibly be for someone else and not them. They couldn't think beyond that realm. That's what a controlling spirit will do. Um, that person would get to church, there'd be lots of suggestions on what should be done today from taking communion to certain songs that should be sung. And as a leader, I would immediately recognize there's a controlling spirit here and I would shut it down to the point where it would offend the person. Brought great offense. Folks, if I could tell you how many times that the Spirit of the Lord was about to break forth like it's been doing recently in our churches, and this person would rise up with a word or a need for prayer or a desire to take the service in a certain direction, and it would just wet blanket the whole thing. Fortunately, the Lord was wanting to help this person. And so he, even though he had me stand against a lot of this, I didn't see the extent of it like I do today. That, that was probably good. We're going to say that was good. But it was always about this person. Always, This person was always wanting to meet after church and always wanting counsel and Folks, that's a controlling spirit. And I hesitate to say these things because then it causes the righteous to back down. So, so you all need to pray about whether this is you or not you. You need to pray about what to repent of here. Because it may not be for you at all. It may be for you to see in someone else say that's going to stop that person's going to stop dominating and controlling my life. <sighs> there's three types of controller. Well, there's many different types of controllers, but I'm, I'm just going to give you three different areas where people can be controlling. And the first type I want to talk about is, is a victim. The person who plays the victim. They control you by their tears, their self-pity, been hurt, insecurities, and fears, and everybody's out to get me. Did you notice what so-and-so's done to me? And the person that plays the victim, behind that victim is manipulation. Another type of controller is the flatterer. They get their ends accomplished by, oh, you know, you're just doing such a great job. and They'll brag you up and boost your ego, and then they withdraw it, turn their back on you and ignore you for a week. That's how they control you. Silent treatment. Another type of controller is someone who's an intimidator. They use anger, accusations, aggression. A lot of times, these type of people, they won't shut up. Constantly popping questions at you. Constantly, they're, they're the ones doing all the talking. There's many different types of controllers, but they use tears. Some of them will use rage. Some of them will use threats. 
Some of them will use questions. Some of them will use moodiness and the silent treatment. And some of them will even use illness. And the whole agenda is to manipulate, manipulate you. To control the situation. To control a person. Now here's where it gets interesting. Getting back into diatrephus. Some will even use religion to control you. They'll use legalism. They'll use guilt. They'll use tradition. They use traditional doctrines, traditional ideas to keep people insecure and dependent on them. You know, it's interesting. I was just talking to a friend of mine who so we're doing some planning on possibly doing a youth Bible school. It's gone way beyond youth. It's, it's now whoever wants it kind of stuff. And... It's, it's going to be a three-week uh, intense boot camp. I'll tell you, you come into that thing controlling, we're going to decontrol you after that's all over. <laughs> this is going to make men out of boys and all kinds of stuff. Put hair on people's chests and everything else. Well, not for the girls. So I interviewed this guy that does this because I, I needed some wisdom because I've never done this before. You know what was one of the interesting things that he said is he said, you know, the intent of this Bible school is to um, get people healed and delivered. And, and he said, what I found was interesting, we would start the Bible school and we'd have all these sessions and he said there were certain people who were sure that all the sessions were for somebody else. And they'd always want to step up and minister to that somebody else. And he said, I've had to shut these people down and say, these sessions are for you. Time for you to get your life cleaned up. Time for you to get straightened out. Time for you to get your mind transformed and renewed. You need to stop trying to minister to everybody else. Leave that to the leadership. We're here to change you, not you to change someone else. I found that quite interesting. I had a friend of mine years ago, used to go, go to one of our churches. This was years ago now, so you can't figure out who it was. But uh, you'd talk to him. And he always had this deep concern about somebody in the church. Deep concern. And uh, after a while, I was like, you know, this guy's got some real issues. Why isn't he concerned about himself? Controller. Controller. So, I want to get into this, this teaching a little bit. I don't know how much I'll, I'll get done here this morning. Um, but that's all right. We, we, we need to walk through this. We need to walk through this as a church. I hear this morning, uh, I don't have an ax to grind with anybody here. But if you all are going to tap into this revival that's coming... Uh, you need to make sure that the man influencing you is a man of God right here. Brother Malin's not a controller. I can tell you that by the Spirit of the Lord. He is not a controller. You need to let that man be influencing you. If there's others in here that are influencing you, that's good. We all need to influence each other. But if the influence coming from somebody else in this house is contrary to what this guy's vision and doctrine purpose is you need to shut that down because it's a diatrephus trying to mess things up you let that thing run its course it'll shut down revival every time see the reaction to this is well I'm not going to let anybody control me 
then we go into a rebellion where nobody can speak into our life, nobody can influence us, and it does away with biblical discipleship. It doesn't work. And I'll tell you the difference between a godly leader leading a group of people and a controller controlling a group of people, sometimes it's a little hard to tell the difference. But by the time I get done, you'll be able to. The fruit... Listen, Brother Rhodes was not a controller. The fruit of it was he took you into the presence of the Lord. I can't remember ever one weekend where he didn't come to Kansas and didn't take us into the presence of the Lord. Heaven would show up. Sure, he was human. He did make mistakes. But he was a man of God who loved the Lord and would take the people of God into the presence of heaven. And he did it for years. So Genesis 1.28, there's a word found after the Lord creates mankind. He tells them something. Anybody know what that word was? It's the word dominion. Take dominion. Another word you could put in there is the word control. You take control. You take dominion. When the Lord spoke that into Adam and Eve, that thing filtered down through to us. There's a desire for us to take control. Nothing wrong with that if we don't become controlling. Dominion. There's a a natural tendency to take the lead. Want to take the lead. You put a group of children out in the playground. Somebody's going to be leading that thing. Somebody's going to step up. Some people do make better followers. Some people make better leaders. and Maybe it has to do with personality and giftings and all of that. But I want to say today there's nothing wrong with good leaders, strong leaders. We need strong leaders. We need courageous leaders. We need biblical leaders. We need men to rise up and lead their homes. But they got to lead them in the right direction. What do you have when you have a man that's leading his family in the wrong direction? Should you submit to that man if you're part of that family? That's a loaded question right there. Ezekiel 22 and uh, verse 30. Where the Lord says, I sought for a man to make up the hedge and to stand in the gap. We're very familiar with that scripture. So in Genesis, we have take dominion. And Adam, if he had not fallen would have been able to do that right. The problem is he fell. And when you and I are born, we are not born in the image of God. We're born in the image of fallen Adam. That's why we need to get born again. When we become born again, one third of us, our spirit man, the new man that's joined together with the Holy Spirit at the new birth, is created in the image of God. Now you've got to give Him dominion and control over the area of your soul and your body. And when you do that, you can take dominion and you can take control in a godly way. And the way you take control in a godly way is you lead people into the presence of the Lord. You point to Jesus. You allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, lead others. Nothing wrong with leaders here. The issue is where are they leading us? Why are they leading us? What's the motive? 
Is it to get my ends accomplished? Or is it to take people into a relationship with Jesus? Two problems with a controller. Number one is it undermines the true leaders, the true leadership of the Holy Spirit and the ones the Holy Spirit has designated to lead a group. There's an undermining when there's a controller. Number two is found in Galatians 5.19, goes through the sins of the flesh, and we get the one called witchcraft. And we think witchcraft is, well, that's that guy out there that's dowsing water, right? Or maybe it's that person over in Haiti that's sticking pins in a voodoo doll. That's witchcraft. Well, it might be. But let me tell you about a form of witchcraft today that messes up and hinders revival from coming to a church. And it has to do with somebody who is so bent on getting their ends accomplished that they manipulate others. That's a form of witchcraft. Manipulation. In 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 23, the Lord, through a prophet, points to a king. And I don't think this king ever realized that he had witchcraft in his life. And the Lord says, through the prophet Samuel, to Saul, by your actions, Saul, you're operating in the spirit of witchcraft. That's found in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and uh, verse 23. Saul was a controller. He was. He had a lack of trust. That's a sign of a controller. He couldn't trust David, even David, though was probably his most trustworthy man that served under him. Had a hard time trusting. Saul was insecure. He was threatened by anybody else with a gift or a talent, like Samuel. Samuel himself said, Lord, I'm afraid this man's going to kill me if I go anoint a king. Insecure, fearful. Saul had a lot of fear in his life. We'll talk about that here. A lot of jealousy. Anybody that could do anything on an equal level with Saul, Saul felt threatened. Suspicious, always suspicious somebody was out to get him. To the point where if he felt like he was losing control, he would throw his javelin at you. This happened to David, and I, did, I, I forgot about this, but he actually took that javelin and threw it at his, at his own son Jonathan when Jonathan disagreed with him. There's religious people like that. Their javelins are words, prating malicious words like a diatrephus, always undermining, always trying to get their ends accomplished and getting their ways accomplished. An example of Saul's controlling actions was when, listen, this is what a controlling person will do. I've seen this. Word of the Lord comes. Kill the Amalekites, man, woman, child, and beast. Kill them all. But that went to, well, we need some of these animals. We need to celebrate this victory by keeping the king alive. And so those are examples. He would change the word of the Lord to suit him. He was concerned about what the people thought. Well, the people said, the people suggested. 
He was bothered by the women that were singing the praises of David. When David came back from victory, a jealousy. If you contrast the difference between Saul and David, you see the difference between a true godly leader and a controller. David was a man after God's own heart. Many followed him willingly. Remember those guys that heard that David, before he was king over all of Israel, and Bethlehem was no longer under, or wasn't under his control yet, David, I don't know if he was singing one of the Psalms, man, he said, I'd just love to have a glass of water from Bethlehem's well there where I used to drink from as a little boy. A couple of his men found out about that, and three of the bravest broke through a garrison of, I think, Philistines. They brought him back a glass of water. You know, when I heard this preach growing up, it was like David poured the glass of water out saying he's not worthy of it. No, that's not what he did. It's not what he did. He took that glass of water instead of drinking it. He gave it as a drink offering unto the Lord. There's a difference. Big difference. There's also a big difference between the leadership of Saul and the leadership of David. And so what do you do when you're under the leadership of a Saul? How do you respond to that? How do you react to that? There's a lot of people would probably point to our president today and accuse him of being a controller and a manipulator. But I truly believe that this man might be the first president since Ronald Reagan that really has the motives of his heart is to make the American people and this nation a better place. He has the interest of the American people in his heart. I really believe that. To me, that makes all the difference. That's the difference between a David and a Saul. He's not up there trying to accomplish his own. I don't even know if he's a Christian. Some say he is. Sometimes the actions, you, you, you wonder... I'm not here to judge that. But I do believe that the intents of his heart is to protect the American people and to make this country a better place. And he stands up for the rights of the believer and the unborn. A lot to be said about that. So I, w- I want to take some time to look at some key differences between a uh, controller and a leader. Sometimes it's kind of hard to identify. Sometimes a controller can be forceful and sometimes a strong leader can be forceful. Sometimes a controller might be a little more manipulative. Their personality might not be as strong, but they're still a controller. They're not as forceful, they're doing it through tears and other manipulative ways. Whereas the person who's strong and forceful gets the rap for being a controller. You can't go by what the carnal eye tells you. I could name some names in our political realm, one of them is Donald Trump. I could give you some other names on the other side of it where they would appear much nicer. Uh-oh. But it's manipulation. It's taken us into the new world order, one world government, strip us of our rights, strip the church of its freedoms.
some key differences between leaders and controllers. You know, a good leader at times will reprove. They'll correct. They'll rebuke. They'll stand against compromise. They'll expose things. And you can say, well, that's manipulation. That's, that's just flat wrong. No, it's not. It's a man with a shepherd's heart who's not a hireling who's running the moment some diatrephus comes along. See, a good leader doesn't always back down and let others run things in the name of, well, I don't want to be a controller. Let's, let's look at some key differences. Number one is... A godly leader has been broken. A controller has selfish ambitions. And unfortunately, a lot of times, this can be true of a younger person. I believe one of the reasons the Bible says not to ordain a novice is because a young person in ministry hasn't been through the refining process that God wants to take him through. When I was ordained, if I would have that to do, well, if I would ordain, well, let me put it like this. If a young guy identical to what I was when I was ordained would come along, I'm not sure I would ordain him. (laughs) I wasn't very refined yet. I was only a year old in the Lord and Right out of lots of, lots of baggage. I could have used another year or two of discipleship, I think. But anyway. The Lord made the best of it. And along the way, there was a breaking process. And a breaking down of things. So Luke twenty eighteen says, 20 verse 18 says, Whosoever shall fall upon this rock... The stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And so there's a breaking, a breaking process in a godly leader. You look at a man like David. What was it? 21 years between the time that Saul or Samuel anointed him to the time where he became king. Those years out in the wilderness in the cave of Adullam. There was a breaking taking place in David's life. The Lord used a controller to help break David and prepare him for ministry to show him this is not what you want to be when you become a ruler. David kept his heart right towards that controller. There's also times or he pointed some things out to Saul. That may need to be done. See, a controller is typically very self-centered, and even though they can appear very confident, a lot of times there's some deep-seated insecurities that cause them to react the way they react. And behind that insecurity is a need for preeminence, a need to be recognized, a need to be in control, a diatrephus that wants preeminence. If you're going to be a godly leader, that's got to go. It's got to go. That have to. It's okay to be preeminent as a leader. If you're broken, if the Lord has given you control, if He's called you, if He's chosen you to lead, then you need to be preeminent and lead. But to love preeminence, that's a diatrephus. To love preeminence. To go after preeminence when God hasn't given it to you. That's a diatrephus.
Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, and it's very interesting where this takes place and at the heels of what this takes place, which we'll get into a little bit, but I just want to read the scripture for what it's worth. Jesus said unto his disciples, as it actually says then, and then leads to the question when. We'll get into that in a little bit. But Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. A godly leader has learned to deny his own desires, carnal fleshly desires. Let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross. Notice Jesus never said, take up my cross. He said, take up your cross. Take up his cross. We all have a cross to bear, and fortunately it's not the one Jesus bore, right? We don't take the sins of humanity upon our shoulders. We don't die on his cross, we die on our cross. But we take up that cross, we deny ourselves, and we follow Jesus. That's the mark of a godly leader, someone who's done that. Verse 23, for whosoever shall save his life, notice that, a controller is out to save himself. A controller is out to save herself, to save their reputation, to save their ideas. They don't want to change. They don't want to crucify. They don't want to deny themselves. So they're out to save themselves. Whosoever shall save his life will lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Now the second difference between a leader and a controller A controller overcomes fear, or, or a leader overcomes fear, but a controller reacts to fear. Sometimes before a true leader can really be broken and become the man of God that God wants him to be, he will actually show some controlling tendencies. Dear Lord, forgive me for any controlling tendencies that I've allowed in my life. A man like that was Peter. Peter, when he'd get freaked out, he would try to take control of the situation. Open mouth, insert foot, right? Anybody like that? So Peter got freaked out one day. You know why? Jesus said to him and Actually, he wasn't talking to him, he was talking to the group. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, From that time forth, Jesus began to show to his disciples how he needs to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. That doesn't sound like fun. And I think that scared Peter. Verse 22, Peter took him and began to rebuke him and say, Lord, be it far from thee. Why did he do that? He wanted to take control of a situation that he couldn't control. Have you ever had some bad news come your way? Like the coronavirus? COVID-19? You know how you control that? Go buy a bunch of toilet paper <laughs> and sanitizer. I went to three stores last night, not to buy toilet paper, but to buy some sanitizer. So I want to control this thing. It's all gone. Ain't none. One fellow said, well, probably the 19th of March we'll have some, but it won't last more than an hour. But toilet paper, what the world does that have to do with this? We've got to control it. You know what happened when Peter said, be it far from thee? 
Jesus started talking to Satan. Didn't talk to Peter. Talked to Satan. Satan, get thee behind me. You know what that's a sign of? Whenever there's a controller that rises up, it's a sign Satan's close by. It's Satan's way of shutting down revival. I got to control this thing. I can't keep my family from getting too involved here because they might get off. Yeah. I'm telling you, what's happening right now, you want to get involved in. You want your children involved in it. You want heaven to touch your home the way heaven's touching my home. And our young people. All right, we got Peter getting freaked out again in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 and verse 4. There appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking to Jesus, Mount of Transfiguration. Verse 5, what's Peter do? Master, if it be good for us to be here, let's make some tabernacles. One for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. But notice the next verse, verse 6. Notice what it says. For he didn't know what to say because they were sore afraid. Behind that need to take control is a fear that's driving you. It's a sign you haven't cast your cares upon the Lord. A godly leader is someone who has learned to overcome fear. You know, fear, I feel it just like everybody else. We all feel it. I got some news the other day, and there's this dread, man. I could feel it. It hung around for a day or two but I chose not to react to it. I chose not to let that control me. See, the spirit of fear is a controlling spirit. It wants to control you. And the problem with the Saul's and the Peter's is they reacted to fear. But you know the good news is, is Peter didn't stay that way. He got filled with the Holy Ghost and power on the day of Pentecost. There's a courage and a boldness back when he couldn't even stand up to a damsel to curse and swear. I never knew Jesus like Peter did. There was one thing driving him to do that. It was a spirit of fear in his life, a need to take control. I feel fear. I know what it feels like. But I'm learning, learning not to react to it. When I feel the fear, step back. I did the other day. What do you have to say, Lord? And the Lord said, I already said it. I've had my say in this situation. I said, okay, we're going with that. I got a trip scheduled, international. In two weeks, common sense would shut that thing down. I didn't pay attention to all this stuff until the other day. I was driving up to the city and I listened to Fox News for one hour. Markets are collapsing. And anyway, one hour and I'm like, man, we got to shut this trip down. So I called my wife and said, you... We need, we need to follow the news. And so she listens to the news the rest of the day. And I get home. She says, we got to shut this trip down. And I said, well, maybe we better check with the Lord. Because I remembered about two months ago, I met with God. And I had some real questions on whether I should go on that trip. And I said, let's just wait 
And the next morning I got in my quiet place and I got that word go. And then I went and bought all the tickets that day. And I said to my wife, I said, you know, I haven't heard anything since that from the Lord. Sure, I heard Fox News. I heard all the recommendations, but I didn't hear anything from the Lord not to go. And so we're going to stay with that unless the Lord tells us different. And in the meantime, we're praying, Lord, if we don't... The last thing I want to do is take COVID-19 to Mexico. See, the problem's not Mexico. The problem's Houston and Mexico City and the airplanes. And the last thing I want to do is bring it back home again. I mean, my goodness, wouldn't that be terrible if you'd be the guy in the community that first got COVID-19? They blamed it all on you? And you own a restaurant? <laughs> See where your mind wants to go with this stuff? You know that's a controlling spirit. It's called fear. Those people going out having to buy toilet paper last night. That's fear. See, a controller becomes a controller when the fear of failure or fear of something comes along and they feel the need just to have to take control. And folks, I'm here to say today that a godly leader takes control at times. But there's a difference in the motive. See, it's hard to tell the difference through the carnal eye. But there is a difference. Can you become aware of a problem that is serious? Might be spiritual, might be physical, might be financial. You become aware of it and only take that problem to the Lord and only talk to Him about it. Never mention it to another person. I'm not sure when I started. Let me go one more, and I'll try to wrap this up maybe tonight, if the Lord lets me. One of the differences between a uh, godly leader and a controller is that a godly leader has learned to trust. He's learned to trust the Lord. He's learned to trust others. A controller is insecure. They're insecure in their relationships with others. They're insecure about whether, how others will respond, how the Lord will respond. Remember the last time I was here. Maybe it wasn't the last time I was here. It was one of the last times I was here. I got up here, and in every church, we've had a little pocket of people that, it wasn't a little pocket, just one or two individuals, that would say something like, well, I find it hard to trust leadership. And they had their valid reasons. I could give you some valid reasons why I shouldn't trust leadership. And I kept hearing this pop up inside a period of about a month from a few different... Indi well, we can't trust leadership. And it kind of seemed to make sense. Yeah, what they've been through, I, I, I can understand that. And then the Lord said to me, he said, why is it that you can trust leadership? You have no problem putting your trust into Brother Malin, Brother Jake, Pastor Sam. You have no problem. And, and you've been as maligned and wronged as anybody, any of them have. But you have no problem trusting leadership, and they do. What's the difference? Trust issues. You ever heard of people that have trust issues? I preached on all that. Dig the message up. Maybe you need to listen to it again. A godly leader learns to trust. A controller is insecure. See, Saul did not trust David, even though David was 100% behind Saul. Supporting him above everybody else. Yet Saul couldn't trust him. Sign of a controller.
We've got to learn to trust again. If you want to have a relationship with somebody, you've got to learn to trust that person. The deeper the level of trust is, the deeper the relationship. You say, well, they haven't earned my trust. Well, fine, but give them a benefit of a doubt. Let them try again. And same way with the Lord. If you want to have a good relationship with the Lord, you need to learn to trust Him. Proverbs 29, verse 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoso puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. COVID-19 verse. Proverbs 31, verse 11. The heart, Proverbs 31, woman. The heart of our husband does safely trust in her. That's interesting. But is he trustworthy? See, I think this guy was trustworthy that the Proverbs 31 woman was trusting. Some men aren't. You can't trust him. What do you do then? Trust him anyway? What do you do if you're married to a controller? Do you trust him anyway? When I become, let me put it this way, too demanding or too pushy, my wife pushes back. And that's okay. That's okay. Some of you wives need to push back less. But some of you need to push back more. You bought into this Anabaptist mindset that I just need to submit to everything, go along with everything. No, you don't. Not if he's a controller. You need to push back. And you can do that in a right way, in an honoring way, and in a way that's not rebellious. I'm navigating some landmines here. We had an interesting thing happen, and I'll close with this. We had Brother Hogan uh, come to our church, and I had a check in me about advertising those meetings, but I felt led to do it, so I did it anyway. And about a month before, and weeks before, you can ask any of the Kansas people that are here. I called our church aside several times. I said, the weirdos are coming out. But you need to see this. Because, you know, when you grow up the way we grew up, where there was no move of the Spirit, the tendency is to take the Charismatics and Pentecostals and their churches as this is where we need to go. You know, whether it be Redding, California, or whatever it is. You know, I've been in this thing for 20 years. Back in the day, it was 20 years ago, it was Word of Faith, man. The, ro- the sun ro- rose and set on the Word of Faith movement. Kenneth Copeland and John Osteen and all those guys. And uh, there was some good stuff there. I cut my teeth on that stuff. Still use it today but not everything in there was okay. And uh, I said, when Brother Hogan comes, I said, the weirdos, the skunks are coming out of the wood pile. (laughs) You can say, well, you just opened the door to it when you said that. Well, maybe I did, but they came. And my goodness, I called our ushers aside. I said, okay, you all need to put the foot down. You get people getting out of hand, you put the foot down. And see, again, it's that controlling spirit. Here's Brother Hogan. What can I get out of him? And I don't care about anybody else in this congregation. And if that means I jump in the front of the fire tunnel three times to get ahead of everybody else and I just keep going through that fire tunnel and nobody else has a turn, it doesn't matter because of 
my needs. Controlling spirit. I'll tell you, I had a big old usher, about 280 pounds, the size of Pastor Sam. Oh, it was Pastor Sam, getting that <laughs> controller's face. you going back at the end of the line. And she got really offended. But I'll tell you what, this will shut down the Holy Ghost. It will. And I'm here to say that that was a pretty obvious controlling spirit, but at the same time, some of them aren't so obvious. Some of them can put on a nice religious smile and a very humble look to things. Those are the ones you got to look out for. We had a prophecy in our church, and it went like this, they're coming. I felt like it was a word of the Lord. They're coming from the east, the west, the north, and the south. This is a reliable prophet, man of God, that I know. And then he said, he said, I'm warning you, there'll be some Jezebels trying to mess things up. And when he said the word Jezebel, I got the word controller. Not all controllers are Jezebels, by the way. Be careful with that word. But I knew it to be of the Lord. And it was interesting. Those Hogan meetings, they came from the north, the south, the east, and the west as far away as New Jersey and California, Michigan, and Florida. I mean, all over the U.S. They packed it out. And there are some weirdos in that bunch now. But we had, we had two controllers try to take that thing over. They want to share their testimonies. Oh, it's just going to be a minute. We just need the microphone for a minute. Oh, no, you don't. Uh-huh. No, you don't. You got to offend a controller. That's the way you handle them. You offend them. You tell that diatrephus, I'm coming down there. I'll deal with him when I'm there. Brother, that's not the spirit of Christ. Oh, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Satan, I rebuke you. Get behind me. It is the spirit of Christ. You cannot let this thing take control. Okay, we better quit here. (laughs) It's getting too intense for me. Here's what I want you to get, though. The end of those services with Brother Hogan. We have a youth Q&A, we called it. Brother Malin, myself, Brother Jake, we sat up there and we let them bounce questions at us for two and a half hours. And uh, now, I I want you to get this. So, uh, meetings, that's intense stuff when you're the hosting pastor. You know, you're up late getting up early, getting ready for stuff. The end of two and a half hours of questions, I mean, it wipes you out now. That, it, that stuff used to not bother me. Brother Rhodes used to say, well, questions wipe me out, but I, t- I know what that's like now. And so the end of two and a half hours of questions, I'm like, we're shutting this thing down. This is, I'm going home, getting sleep, and that's one thing I got in mind. And so I get up to shut this thing down, and somebody pops up from the back and comes up and says, hey, I need prayer. So we prayed for him, and uh, we we had been talking about the mind. He wanted prayer for his mind. And somebody else said, well, I want prayer for my mind, too. So I said, okay, let's get this over with. Do this as fast as we can. How many people want prayer for their minds? Everybody comes up, all the youth. And all of a sudden, I'm leading them. And so, so, okay, here's the fast way we do this. We lead them in a corporate prayer. (laughs) So I'm leading them in a corporate prayer. And uh, all of a sudden, the power of God comes in that place. And I mean, just, Lord says, touch them all on their foreheads. When I did, I mean, they just like dominoes. And all of a sudden, this joy comes in. And it wasn't the manacle laughing. It was just a joy, a giggling, just a, 
smile. I mean, it was a presence of the Lord coming in, and it was just yokes were breaking off. And so, anyway, that's what I call revival. The Lord wants to do that here. He wants to do that in your life. He wants to do it in this church. I want to say something. The key to this thing is let this man lead. Don't you have some diatrophist think he can take control here and undermine his authority. Listen, if I'd be in this church, I'd be, and I wouldn't be a preacher or an apostle, I'd be taking my young people and saying, all right, you get behind this pastor. You let him speak into your life. Him and his wife, they're not controllers. They got some good... You let this man and his wife lead you, they'll take you into revival. You want that. Okay, I'm done. All yours, brother. May I steal one of your mints? You know what I thought about stealing? I was back there. Two, great. I I was back in your bathroom. I thought about stealing that... uh, uh, (laughs) 